Hello, everyone. This is Guillermo Sabatier, your host for the show. I am the Director of International Services for the Health and Safety Institute. And this week, I am coming at, at you from uh, Vacaville, California. I was here for work. I'll be flying back home tomorrow, uh, back to Florida. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have avoided the uh, the effects of Hurricane Ian, but uh, some folks on the other side of the state were not. So uh, again, uh, pray, uh, thoughts and prayers go to them. And uh, by the time we get back home, we will probably be doing some work in order to assist. So um, along with those topics today, we're going to be discussing what's next with uh, distributed energy resources. Uh, it's rather interesting the fact that we're, we're looking at a potential use of a resource, right, that could be useful in these sort of situations, such as a hurricane or a system-wide blackout. And that's the first thing that comes to mind, right, is having the ability to be able to be self-sustaining. Uh, the fact that you're a resource, you have both solar, the ability to generate, and then you also have storage, whether it's a battery or in the form of an EV, electric vehicle, or something like a Tesla Powerwall, for example, that ends up uh, that you have that deployed in your house. Either way, combine those together and you have yourself a pretty reliable resource that should keep you running for a few hours at least. Uh, sometimes longer. Uh, one of the things we're seeing now is a lot of incentives, um, especially here in California, for example, I'm seeing quite a bit of uh, rooftop solar everywhere, and I see the effects of that as far as how that is dispatched and how they uh, operate that from the perspective of a bulk electric system. So um, uh, PG&E, along with other larger utilities, are currently in the in the process of uh, carrying out some testing some pilots on how to dispatch uh, distributed energy resources and integrate that into the grid, more so like a partnership between the, uh, the, 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 the prosumers, which is both a consumer and producer of energy, and the utilities themselves. Uh, so right now they're undergoing that pilot and ideally what they're gonna end up doing is um, y using those resources as another virtual power plant. Now, in Florida, uh, one of the larger utilities, Florida Power Light, has uh, currently been offering an incentive program that will pretty much cover the cost of a level two charger, and meaning it's the materials, the installation, the permitting, the labor, and they will give you unlimited off-peak charging. Uh, and all that requires is a commitment of 10 years and the monthly payment of that is it's about $36 a month, between 30 and five and $40 a month. So that's really a bargain because uh, an example would have been like a Tesla Model 3 at about 2000 miles a month, uh, daily charging if, where I'm at, uh, it'll run you about $120 a month charge. And, and, and that's your energy expenditure, right? For charging that vehicle pretty much every day. So, uh, so a 2,000 mile commute uh, monthly, for example, that's about, uh, on that EV, it's about $120 a month. So e even at that rate, uh, being charged $36 a month for that unlimited off-peak charging is an incredible bargain. Now, the incentive there, of course, is um, they they will be able to control the time and rate right, of, uh, of charging, especially off-peak charging. But what I anticipate will be the next step in the revolution will be uh, coming up with a partnership and agreement with the automakers that will allow them to then dispatch that the, those those devices. And I say the word devices, meaning the, the, the EV batteries, right? They'll be able to dispatch them using uh, some kind of software that they'll agree on and uh, ultimately use that as a resource, uh, depending on what the utility needs. Well, of course, that could be anything from supplementing their, their generation resources all the way to even providing voltage or frequency support. Uh, the other the other extreme case would be nat naturally using that uh, far off into the future, perhaps as a, as a black star resource or something to recover from a blackout, which becomes interestingly important during these events where you have natural disasters. <laughs> Now, on the other side of that spectrum, of course, is the, 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 the challenge and the risk of uh, having uh, an energized conductor from the customer side back into the system that that definitely presents a certain level of risk for utility personnel especially when they're working in restoration so there will be some kind of interlock or lockout where they will have to be um, 
somewhere in the some breaker some breaker at uh, on the customer's meter side will have to be opened automatically and that will prevent that that back feed from uh, getting into the system so there we see that particular case for that and i'm, I'm suspecting a lot of different utilities are going to start doing this as well um we, we just saw some of the co-ops were also taking advantage of some of the incentives offered as well um not just the uh, level two chargers but also so they were getting into the the uh, the uh, fiber communications business. So when they're uh, deploying fiber optic communications systems out in the rural areas through their distribution circuits, and then they're getting involved with with the telecommunications part part of the market, then there's definitely an opportunity there for not just the, the ability to get into the uh, high speed internet, but also the ability to control all of these resources uh, much more efficiently. Which, Clearly, the ability to do this depends a lot on uh, high-speed internet and uh, getting that telemetry back and getting the control from the control centers down to the uh, individual prosumers or distributed energy resource. So where does this leave us as a, um, I guess, as a nation, right? Um, ideally, what we're looking at the transition from where we're at today to eventually having uh, zero emissions generation and, and that is impossible to do right now with the step change. You just cannot go totally all solar or all, all wind without having a certain type of mix in your portfolio. So some of the viable transition uh, generation resources could be uh, natural gas like we're using now, and we're using a lot more of it. But uh, the idea in the next few years, we'll probably be looking at um, small modular reactors, which the Department of Energy had just approved several designs. So we'll be seeing a few of these deployed in the next few years, um, particularly smaller uh, SMRs, so small modular reactors, SMRs that will be probably, probably about the size of 20 or 40 megawatts. And those could be deployed pretty much anywhere in the country, uh, close to load centers specifically, and very nondescript and um, not a large footprint. Um, the other interesting thing about them is that they're completely modular. Which means they'll, they'll be able to be uh, once the fuel expends and that those fuels last, you I know, mean, over a decade or more, they'll be able to pull that modular reactor out, replace it with the new one, and so on and so forth. The other thing is the technology is going to be improving. We are quite a bit behind the rest of the world when it comes to nuclear technology development, along with training the personnel that comes along with that. So as we as we progress forward, hopefully this will be a change for us uh, as we're better positioned globally to be a major energy producer. Um, now, as we're looking at other events throughout the world, and I'm sure you're familiar with what's happened with the uh, with the Nord pipelines uh, up in the Baltic Sea, uh, for us as an opportunity to be able to help uh, Europe with our natural gas or even our our LNG, which has to be shipped over there uh, in, uh, in maritime commerce, which of course adds greatly to the price of of that commodity. So for them, getting natural gas from, from Russia was inexpensive and always available, whereas now their natural gas has to come in the form of LNG, shipped, literally shipped uh, from the US to, to Europe. So that, that makes the price way more expensive. So hopefully with that, that'll, that'll give them a, a better chance of doing well this winter because they do expect a rough winter. Now, uh, given the fact that, for example, Germany has had some severe issues with their um, with their expected energy supplies, France has stepped up and has been providing them with a lot of electricity, mainly from their nuclear fleet. I mean, France, I think it's the majority of their portfolio runs on nuclear energy, and uh, those generators are dispatchable, meaning that they, they don't sit at base load 24 hours a day for months at a time. They are dispatched in a lot of cases, just like a uh, conventional uh, internal combustion or fossil fired plant, which natural gas or anything else like that. So usually a lot of resistance from that in nuclear, but France, France is, is, is really at the cutting edge of uh, nuclear energy. Uh, so the South Koreans have done a quite a good job as well. Now um, they, they installed the... Uh, Two, two unit react two uh, two reactor unit over there and uh and uh, 
in Dubai, and uh, they're doing the same thing for uh, Saudi Arabia pretty soon. So uh, as this begins to proliferate, you're going to you're going to see the resurgence of nuclear energy back again, namely because of the fact that we don't have um, the resources to be able to, like, or or rather the reliability in the renewable resources that we have right now. Now, uh, that being said, I mean, it's not every place will be as inviting for a large nuclear site. So you, so that's why the um, SMRs may become more attractive in markets like ours uh, throughout the country. And so what else can we do in, in really reality, right? Rather than relying on gas, uh, trying to build up a nuclear site that's dispatchable or dealing with the uh, variability of uh, renewable resources, well, well, one of the answers here is uh, the distributed energy resources. And as as more and more um, buildings have them, uh, the fact that they're, they'll become more of a viable resource when they're aggregated throughout the country. And a lot of utilities just seem to start, are looking at that with, with a serious application as a, uh, as a reliable resource. Um, now with that is challenges. Uh, I mean, well, for an EV, you can probably run run a whole house for quite a, quite a few hours. And looking at the example of the uh, Ford Lightning pickup truck, and based on the capacity that that vehicle has, you know, they can they can run the house. Uh, typical fifteen hundred kilowatt load, right, in in a household for a few hours, and which really is enough to get through like a like a minor disturbance, right? But something like what happened in Florida, it's going to take a whole lot more to be able to manage that i mean possibly, possibly if if the solar panels survive the uh, the wind damage and that's a big if then you know you, you can then hopefully you charge those batteries on a daily basis and then you can rely on that the rest of the day but unlikely that you know you'll be able to sustain yourself 24 hours not in the current uh, state of technology or efficiency of panels or or unless you have a, a large enough battery bank that you continually charge but um, with motor loads like running air conditioning or, or or something else that may take a long time um, which brings me to my next point um, there is the possibility of using a lot of heat pumps uh, out there in, in colder environments so those heat pumps themselves become a potential source of stored energy as well so a lot of different options that that can be used at this time and they're being looked at and one of the challenges that, that we see of course is the 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 ability to dispatch these resources so uh, currently at this time um all, all we see um rooftop solar or or the utilities what they're using when it comes to storage is naturally um it, it it's being viewed as negative load. So when when you have when you have the load during the day and the, your your resources are putting out energy from that regard, you, all all you'll see it is a decline in load. And sometimes that load drops pretty low between the hours of ten and three in the, ten a.m. and three in the afternoon. Well, that's when the sun is brightest. So the challenge there is to treat it as a virtual power plant, which again is. The aggregation rule, uh, FERC issued an order uh, last year about, uh, a year before last, I'm sorry, about uh, order 2222, um, allowing aggregation. But, you know, you know, that's yet to be seen as far as how that develops. So uh, having, so the next question that we have, right, is running out of these distributed energy resources, right? So the dispatchability is, is one aspect of it. But what happens when, it, when when all this flow coming in from the distribution network is flowing its way back into the uh, transmission system or the bulk electric system, right? So eventually that's going to cause either some kind of instability or it's, it's going to prove very difficult to be able to plan or run system studies with that particular resource in mind. So especially when almost every house out there is going to have this, right? Uh, sooner or later, a lot of homes, the majority of homes here in California, from what I'm seeing, you know, have have uh, solar panels. I mean, it's only a matter of time before they begin to install batteries or they begin to hook up their, use their EVs as, as a resource and they combine all that together and you have a DER, a distributed energy resource. So the the next step in this case really is coming up with, uh, uh, really it's it's getting the automakers to agree to be able to dispatch the cars as a dispatchable resource. Uh, naturally, you know, that could, that could affect the way they 
they apply warranties to those devices that make sure in the life of the certain batteries. So, of course, uh, there's going to be an incentive uh, where the utilities will probably pay for availability, and, and they'll certainly pay a little more, perhaps, for the use and the dispatch of that resource at that time. Um, but right now, not a lot of automakers have agreed to 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 make make themselves available, uh, much less agree on a common protocol to be able to run these resources. But that's coming. That's uh, that seems to be next on the horizon, and, and once that hurdle is uh, overcome, I, uh, I think it's going to be uh, the next phase in the evolution of this particular resource. Now, that's, that's all well and good, but how do you control all these resources? How do you collect all this data real time, manage it, uh, give yourself uh, turn this data into useful information, and then make decisions based on that? Meaning you you have to control the system, and that happens second by second, twenty four hours a day. So that in itself is going to be a big challenge when it comes to um, communication and bandwidth for. Um, having the sort of visibility and control of all of these resources. So for now, it seems like uh, one of the uh, one of the companies that I think is ahead of the game when it comes to developing this, this is perhaps OATI. Um, they're, they're, they've always been ahead of everything else when it comes to managing uh, energy transactions. And uh, they themselves are already quite involved in the distributed energy resource management systems software so uh, uh, my bet would probably be beyond them i mean siemens is doing its, uh, its, its work um national renewable energy labs has also done quite a bit of work with that and there's at least 20 other other organizations that are all competing for that uh that particular uh, uh protocol that that will win out over everybody else so so we'll see i mean it's still some time before we see anything viable and useful come out but um, no, but I think uh, open access uh, is a company is probably going to be ahead of everybody else in this regard. Now, uh, on the topic of DERs and where we're headed, right? Uh, I, I think to me, what's next is really is, is going to be a partnership. Once all of those technical hurdles are ironed out and overcome, the really is going to be more of a partnership between the utilities. Uh, and ultimately the customers and, and in the middle of that it won't it won't no longer be just the transmission operators it'll also be the distribution providers so now the distribution providers won't only be ha uh, watching flow going from from top to bottom in their direction now it's going to be flow in both directions and occasionally there'll be something as granular as uh customers buying and selling power from each other on the secondary bus so that would be interesting. And a lot of those applications will more than likely be um, run on a mobile platform, or at least you'll be able to access it in a mobile platform. Um, clearly, there's going to be some hardware that um, operates behind the meter at the customer side. And that, of course, always links up to the utility. And at the same time, you will need a lot of bandwidth. But uh, one of the things that, I, that that is being for, foreseen is is really having that kind of a flexibility and availability to be able to sell and share or do peer-to-peer -peer energy trading uh, between neighbors, so to speak. The next stage of that will be, of course, um, selling, buying into or, or, or participating in a larger aggregator market where you are one of thousands of people that are throwing your few kilowatts into this larger pool. And that aggregator is a, is a virtual power plant that will be deployed somewhere in the system. So we'll see what happens then. Um, of course, my biggest concern of all, really, with all these developments is, first and foremost, will always be cybersecurity. Uh, once you begin to, to introduce all these different um, access points, you know, now you have a, a real challenge when it comes to... Uh, uh, not just keeping everybody out, but the sort of damage that this could this could incur on a system. Meaning, um, you have one dominant platform that that runs all all of these uh, aggregators or even all of these smaller DERs. Um, can you imagine that particular uh, platform being compromised, and then they're able to control the input and the output of those resources? Well, that could really cause some damage on the system. So, hopefully, that's that's what, what I think would be one of the one of the biggest risks at this time. I mean, once we get past all those, all those hurdles and then we get the technology ironed out, 
we get the agreements between the automakers, the battery manufacturers, and and, and the utilities. You know, and to the point that you get customers on board with that partnership, where they're getting an uh, an some kind of equity in that in that uh, participation, whether they're being paid for the energy they sell back, or they're being paid for them to absorb all this energy as excess, or even being paid to be available, right, uh, for dispatch in a system. It could be a matter of voltage support or frequency support. Once all that's figured out, right, that that next hurdle really will be uh, will be cybersecurity, and, and hopefully that's being looked at way ahead of everything else because. A lot of those competitors that are vying for those protocols, I'm not going to mention the names right now, but um, a lot of those are are working in an open source platform, which is great when you want to share a lot of answers and, and resources, but uh, that also can introduce the potential for a lot of accidental or even deliberate um, vulnerabilities that can be later on accessed and, and, and used against us or even weaponized. So... Um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of bad actors out there. Some of those are individual hackers, but some of those are also nation states that are that are that, of course, you know, looking at ways to be able to affect us as a nation. So, this could easily be one of those things that that gets rolled into the whole um, national. I mean, you treating energy as a national security policy. So uh, I mentioned that before in, in previous shows, and and it's something that I still resonate with in the fact that as as we move further along with this tech it's going to be something even more significant. So, and and, and ideally, um, we shouldn't completely do away with fossil fuels. Um, there should be like a, a small minimal base load requirement to have that in order to give ourselves that kind of, to give ourselves diversity when it comes to the way we generate energy. Uh, relying too much on one thing is also dangerous. I mean, a lot of utilities right now have a large reliance on natural gas. Um, of course, natural gas is, is a, only makes a fraction of the emissions that oil used to make or carbon for that matter. You know, a lot of utilities have used natural gas to move away from, from, from these um, uh, large emission producing resources. So again, that's been the transition of fuel. Um, and as the years go by, they, they get a lot cleaner and the natural gas is rather abundant and expensive and it's a lot cleaner than oil and natural gas, but eventually uh, there is a pressure to get away from that entirely. So um, we, we will see where, where that leads. Um, right now we're in the business apparently of selling a lot of natural gas to Europe. So for now that, you know, we're, we're going to be in that business for a while, it seems. Um, hopefully um, nuclear over there makes a comeback. I know I know that I haven't completely retired or dismantled some of the nuclear plants. I think they can still be brought out of mothballs and brought back online, but that wouldn't be, that, that's not something that will happen right away. So it could be take some time. But along with that, though, I I am pretty optimistic that these DERs will, will, will be a, a very viable and significant resource especially when treated as a partnership between the utilities and all of the consumers. So um, it seems like a bright future, and I really look forward to it. Anyway, that's all I have for today. I want to thank you all for taking part. And if you have any questions, just uh, make sure you like and subscribe and uh, write questions and comments, and I'll try to get to them and answer them if I can. So thank you again. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.